Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I uh, really enjoy talking about spinal muscular atrophy and I'm really glad to see that there's a lot of interest in spinal muscular atrophy today. So uh, before I begin, I'm um, talking about the therapeutic uh, strategies approved and investigational. I just want to uh, reveal my disclosures. Just there are some relevant disclosures. Some of them I've done some consulting work with some of the uh, companies that have been developing these drugs. So I'm just going to really, I, Dr. DeVivo really provided a very nice introduction. I'm just going to review some of the most important aspects of uh, spinal muscular atrophy as it's related to treatment. Um, and then I'll talk about various different strategies to treatment. Some of them are approved and some of them are it's still investigational, but they're all very interesting to think about. At this point, this is obviously not a comprehensive uh, view of uh, all the therapeutic strategies under investigation. These are just the ones that I'm most aware of. Okay. So spinal muscular atrophy, as we have just heard, it's uh, chromosome 5Q. Uh, it's autosomal recessive. This is the incidence, one in about 11,000 live births. Uh, it's the causative gene has now been identified uh, now 20 some years ago, uh, SMN1, which encodes the SMN protein. And if you look across the different phenotypes, type 1, type 2, and type 3, they used, we used to think that they were different diseases. We had, didn't really have much of a basic understanding probably 50 some years ago, but as we've developed a better understanding of these diseases, we realize that these are really all the same disease. And you look across the spectrum and you say, wow, they look so different. And that's, of course, why we thought they were different diseases. Um, and, but the reason why they're the same disease is because they are due to the same underlying cause. There's a deficiency of SMN protein, primarily in the motor neurons, but there's a deficiency of prim uh, SMN protein systemically because this is a, a gene which is being expressed in nearly all tissues. Um, so what distinguishes the infant over on the left uh, with infantile SMA versus the type 2, the sitter, as well as a stander slash walker. Over on the right, you can see she's actually in her 40s, um, and she's able to stand, and she can actually walk a little bit. Um, what really probably our basic understanding is that the, the, what distinguishes this these different phenotypes is probably the relative deficiency of SMN. And there's some significant... Um, evidence to support this, if we look at the second gene that we're now aware of, SMN2, and we look at the number of physical copies of this SMN2 gene, we see that there are more copies um, in the patients that tend to be milder. Type 1s tend to have about two copies, type 2 uh, tend to have three copies, and type 3 patients, the walker standards, the milder patients, they tend to have more copies, up to three or four. So that, so just to look a little bit at the genetics, as Dr. DeVivo has introduced to us, this is what the genomic structure, it's helpful to look at this even if you're not uh, really into genetics. Um, and these are the exons. And what happens is, and this is a, the principle of splicing, which is that the exons at some point get combined together through the splicing process and you make this mature messenger RNA. And if all the exons are included in this gene, then it encodes a functional protein. So 1, 2A, 2B, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all included, you make a functional protein. Now, SMN2 is just slightly different, and the most important difference is actually within exon 7, as Dr. DeVivo has introduced to us. It's instead of a C in a very specific position within that exon, it's a T. And that actually does not change the protein sequence that would be encoded by this gene, but what it does do is it alters the way this gene is spliced. So most of the time, seven is now excluded. It is not spliced into um, the final messenger RNA, and as a result, a, a non-functional protein, which is unstable, is likely to be made. It, it's a little bit leaky, though. It can actually make a full-length messenger RNA um, in about 10% of the time, and that results in functional protein. So it wouldn't matter to any of us um, who don't have SMA um, about what SMN2 is doing, but the patients who have SMA are missing SMN1, and as a result, they're relying on that 10%. That's basically the, the lifeline of the patients who have SMA. 
So just show you a little more, more explicitly, the messenger RNA results in protein 100% of the time. So I just show 10 green um, groups of circles to show functional protein. SMN2, however, 10% of the time is able to make, uh, only 10% of the time is able to make a full-length transcript. 90% of the time, it does not make a full-length transcript. And as a result, uh, it only makes about 10% the amount of protein. And in the patients who have SMA, they're missing SMN1. So as a result, they're relying on this little bit of green over here on the left. And that's the lifeline that these patients have that promotes the survival of motor neuron. And as we already discussed, if you're missing SMN1, uh, the more copies of SMN2 ha you have, the more physical copies you have, the more functional protein you're going to be able to synthesize. And so higher copies of SMN2 are correlated and likely related to a milder form of the disease. Just a little bit more about the genetics. Um, 95% of patients actually have a deletion. And just to show you what we're talking about, you inherit one chromosome from mom, you inherit the other chromosome from dad. 90% um, of patients actually have both copies deleted. Okay. And they're relying on the SMN2 copies, which I show two copies here, but there could be more, three, four, uh, to actually make the SMN. But actually 5% of patients have, are what we call compound heterozygous. And so they have a deletion on one chromosome and the other chromosome, which I arbitrarily designated a paternal chromosome from dad. It doesn't mean that it's always dad's fault. <laughs> yeah. um, there could be a point mutations, as, as I indicate here, on, with a star, okay? Meaning that there is some spelling mistake somewhere with an exon 7. Um, and it doesn't have to be with an exon 7. Um, it could be on another exon, although if it's on another exon, it's harder for us to figure out if it's on SMN1 and SMN2 because of the techniques that we use to sequence DNA. But if it's on, in exon 7, we can definitely state that, if it's, that it's in SMN1. There's also something else called a genetic modifier, and that just means that there's a slight variation um, you can have a specific sequence with an SMN2. It's at position 859. Um, I just show it here for completeness sake. What it tends to do is it actually makes the SMN2 a little bit more leaky and it actually makes more SMN off of the SMN2 gene. So these patients tend to be milder. Sometimes that comes up. But what was really important in the development of treatments was actually to develop an animal model because um, only humans have SMN2. Uh, we don't actually, even primates don't have SMN2. So what had to be done was that we had to engineer mice uh, to actually have SMN2, and then they also, we also had to engineer mice to have mutations with an SMN1. And a lot of that was, um, a lot of the preclinical experiments that led to a lot of the treatment strategies that have been used have actually been done on these mouse models. But as Dr. DeVivo uh, introduced and, and discussed, um, SMN2 very clearly became a target early on for treatment of SMA because SMN2 is capable of making SMN, and if there's some way that we can tweak SMN2 to, to make more SMN protein, then that's actually a therapeutic strategy because if these patients are deficient in SMN protein, if we can increase, if we can boost the amount of SMN protein that these patients are able to produce off of the SMN2 gene, then that would actually partially restore and, and fix the, uh, the, the def deficiency that we're talking about in, in these patients. So looking across the gene, you can see that perhaps there's uh, ways, and what I'm showing here is that the arrow going to the, the left, it's a strong arrow going to the left, showing that most of the time exon 7 is, is excluded, and as a result, a non-functional SMN protein is made, and a very small little arrow going to the right. But if there's some way to somehow tweak it so that exon 7 is included more you know, at, at a higher frequency, then you're um, more likely to make more functional SMN protein. And so the strategy that was initially taken was to use antisense oligonucleotides. So using DNA, RNA-like molecules, they've been synthetically altered so that they could be used as therapeutic drugs. Um, and Ionis has actually developed this chemistry. So the idea here is to use the Watson-Crick base pairing that you see over here on the left. Um, 
And except one of the strands, the backbone is changed so that it's uh, stable enough to be used as a, as a drug. And once again, just to show, if you're trying to block certain, certain sequences, undesirable sequences, you can use antisense oligonucleotides using the Watson-Crick base pairing um, um, that has been well described. But of course, the backbone, which is shown here in red, is different, so it can be used as a therapeutic agent. This is a summary of a, almost 60 different experiments um, published by Adrian Craner, showing all the different targets that they tried to hit to, to try to figure out what could possibly promote exon 7 inclusion. And this, the uh, whole idea is to modulate splicing so that exon 7 is included at a higher frequency. And so green is a relatively successful experiment. And so what you can see is there's a nice strong green over there on the right, and that is a sequence that was identified to be the target for the drug that we now call nusinersen. So just to summarize, what we're talking about is a sequence that's a little bit downstream of exon 7, and that seems to have a repressive effect, relative repressive effect on exon 7. If you block that sequence, then you will unrepress it, and as a result, you'll shift things over to the right, resulting in an increase in the SMN protein that's being synthesized off the SMN2 gene. So that's the preclinical experiments. This led to the human experiments, the clinical trials, of course, we're talking about um, a motor neuron disease, and um, so delivering the uh, nusinersen, um, it would be important to deliver it into the target tissue, in this case, intrathecal or CSF injections of this antisense oligonucleotide became the, the ideal way to deliver this, um, this drug. So we're talking about doing lumbar punctures, spinal taps with intrathecal injections into the spinal fluid space. There were two double-blind sham controlled studies, and this is, this is really quite a heroic effort, I think, across all the different sites that participated in these multicenter studies. We're talking about taking these children, infants, and some of the uh, younger children, we would have to sedate them, and they would take, be taken into a room where they would either uh, receive an intrathecal injection or they would receive a sham, so we would either do the injection or pretend to do, do the injection. Of course, that had to be blinded, so there had to be teams that actually were sworn to secrecy. Uh, when they went in the room, they would not be allowed to tell the investigators outside the room what, was, what had happened inside the room. Um, and so these are the studies. Uh, they're known by the nicknames Endear and Cherish, double-blind sham-controlled studies, 120 patients. Um, this is um, the motor milestone scores from the Endear study, the infant study. And what you can see is there's a separation, a nice separation that's seen um, in the treatment group compared to the sham treated group. And what you can see is, as Dr. DeVivo was talking about the nurture study, there are some, there are patients that were treated very early on in this time period that we call the pre-symptomatic patients. You know, arguably they're mostly pre-symptomatic, but you know, that's, that's, all, of course, a philosophical debate at this point. But I think the take-home message is early treatment results in um, better outcomes. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to treat before you've actually lost motor neurons. So the earlier treatment, the better. This is just, um, you'll be hearing about these scores a little bit later. I think tomorrow is when, when we're talking mostly about the uh, the Heine, the Hammersmith, the Chop and Ten, and so forth. So this is the Cherish study. These are the sitters in the, um, the, uh, the double-blind sham controlled, looking at the Hammersmith functional motor scale expanded. And you can see there's a divergence in the scores as well. Um, certainly an impressive divergence after one year. This is the revised upper limb module, showing also a divergence of the two groups. This is just to sort of show a high-level summary. You have type 1 patients, type 2 patients. They're studied separately. And then, and then recruiting these patients early on in a pre-symptomatic study versus a symptomatic study. And these are the nicknames of the studies that, uh, that, uh, that were carried out. There's also some data on type 2, type 3 patients. This, these were some of the earlier studies um, when it was dose finding. 
And what's interesting is there were some type 3 patient studies that were studied in this study called CS2, CS12. And these patients were receiving nusinersen open label for what you can see here is up to three, more than three years. And the distance that was walked within six minutes increased on average up to 100 meters. Um, certainly this is not definitive proof, but it does seem to be quite encouraging. We also saw a couple of patients who had already lost ambulation, so they were ambulatory at some point, they lost ambulation, then they got started on nusinersen, and they actually regained the ability to walk. Two out of four of these patients did. So certainly extremely encouraging efficacy signals, even among the patients who are a little bit milder and a little bit older. What about adults with type 2 and type 3? Well, this is a a little bit more difficult topic to discuss I mean, because there were no adults that were included in the clinical trials. The rationale, however, for treatment is that SMA is a progressive disease and if you have an intervention that may prevent progression, that would certainly have its um, therapeutic role. And there's plenty of anecdotal data uh, looking at response to treatment, but it's difficult to quantify at this point. And um, certainly I think most of us do feel if a patient wants treatment, that we feel compelled to treat these patients because we believe there is rationale for therapeutic benefit. But some teens and adults have cha challenging anatomy. I'll just show you a few pictures from um, my patients. Um, I think what you can see, this is a 20, almost 30-year-old young man, uh, never had a fusion or never had spine surgery, and I think it's difficult to totally appreciate, so I'll try to explain to you, this is his butt, okay? His spine goes over here, makes a U-turn, and comes back over here, and his head's over here. He wanted nusinersen, so we put him in a CT scanner, and that's where we X marks the spot where we're gonna put the needle. What's interesting is, this is to show you spine anatomy. This is a picture taken out of Netter. And what you can see is this is the spine, so this is supposed to be pointing backwards. In this patient here, it's pointing sideways. Okay, so not only is there scoliosis, there's significant rotation of the whole spine where the anatomy is completely altered. And so this may seem kind of scary, but actually to a radiologist and to many of us who've been treating these patients, this is an ex interesting opportunity uh, <laughs> because you actually have a straight shot into the intrathecal space. It's just that what used to be lateral is now pointing posteriorly, kind of, okay? And so if you do this under CT guidance, you can actually place the needle in to the lateral foramen, okay, and introduce the medication um, transforaminally, as we call it. So, and as you can see here, there's that little, um, hyper-dense shadow of the needle. That's actually the radiologist guiding his needle into the lateral foramen. We have a few patients who wanted it pretty badly, and we said, well, the only way to do it safely is probably to put it into your neck. Um, and so under radiological guidance, we've done this in a few patients. It certainly always makes us nervous, but... Uh, I think the radiologists have been very, very careful and, and thoughtful about this, and so we have confidence in them. A few patients have actually asked to have a catheter placed in, so we've actually, what you can see here is, you can't see the catheter, but you can see the port. What I show over here on the left is what the port looks like. It doesn't have to be a port. There are also Omaya reservoirs that have been used. At our site, we tend to use a port, uh, which is the same kind of port that you might place up here to access the, um, the vena, have a central venous axis. And it's a catheter that's commonly used for an intrathecal um, pump, like an intrathecal baclofen pump, and that's, that's what's been used in a few cases. But what about the dose? Well, questions have been raised about the CSF volume and how it changes um, as patients get older and bigger. And certainly people are wondering if uh, adults, teens, um, who, have, who are certainly bigger, um, if we're dosing 12 milligrams of nusinersen is an appropriate dose. And, and I think the uh, manufacturer, um, Biogen, has responded and said, well, we're going to do a higher dose study 
called the Devote Study, which is ongoing. I'm going to shift gears now to small molecule modulators. So the idea behind this is that these are molecules which are orally bioavailable. They potentially have a systemic effect. Now, we know that um, SMN is important in motor neurons, but um, um, it's also expressed all throughout all tissues, and it could have a systemic effect. If It's not clear if the systemic effect is important, uh, because um, at this point, we, all we know is the deficiency seems to primarily affect motor neurons. But the idea here is that it's, it's, it's also modulating splicing. Uh, we just don't know exactly how it does it. It was pulled out of a screen, of a high-throughput screen of small molecules, and the drug comes in and seems to do something around exon 7, and it affects splicing in a way which has, has um, a visual appearance which is very similar to what, uh, what Newson Urson does. So it, in, it promotes inclusion of exon 7. And as a result, we increase the amount of SMN protein that's being expressed in these patients. So that's been studied, certainly at, in the preclinical level, in different animal models, and eventually it's uh, entered clinical trials. There are two molecules I'm going to talk about. This is Branaplam, which is a Novartis-sponsored program. They had one study, which was done a few years ago. Um, we haven't heard much more about it, but this is some of the data. Um, and it's, I'm, I haven't heard much about whether they're going to continue developing this medication, but it did seem to have some promising um, clinical data looking at CHOP and 10 scores. And this is Rizdaplam, which Dr. DeVivo did briefly mention in his talk. Um, it was also a small molecule. It's not one of these molecules that was, uh, that was published back in 2014. It's a, a modification of one of these molecules. But again, it's a small molecule. It's oral, systemically bioavailable. Uh, Roche, PTC, SMA Foundation worked together on this. And um, the phase one study in healthy volunteers was completed a few years ago. And now there are multiple phase three studies that are ongoing including firefish, sunfish, rainbow fish, and um, jewel fish, I think, is another study as well. I'm just going to show you this little um, chart, which is similar to the new Sinersen chart I showed a little bit earlier, that type 1s as well as type 2s and type 3s are being studied. Uh, both symptomatic and pre-symptomatic studies are, being, are ongoing. And here's some of the early clinical data that came out of the infant study. This is the CHOPIN10 score showing an increase in the CHOPIN10 score that we're obviously wanting to see in, the, in these patients. So one of the things about an oral systemically bioavailable drug is that you can actually look at um, blood. You can act because SMN is, is being expressed in some of the, some of the uh, white blood cells. And you can look at the SMN2 expression, so it's a little biomarker, so to speak, to see if SMN is actually being increased. And so what you're seeing here is a couple of different studies. Firefish is the infant study, sunfish, um, the next bar, and then there are two different sunfish groups, the younger group and the older group. Uh, jewelfish is a study that I briefly mentioned. Um, and then you can see healthy volunteers. And so there appears to be an increase in the amount of SMN protein that's being expressed in the blood of, these, uh, of the patients that are in these studies. And the FDA has accepted a new drug application. This is as of a little bit more than a week ago. Um, and so I think we're looking to see what the FDA decision is sometime next year. And I'm going to shift gears to gene therapy now. So what we're talking about here is using viral capses or sort of re-engineering viruses to deliver a gene that's, that's missing in patients. So this has really become sort of the exciting new strategy in a lot of different genetic diseases. Um, and in particular, uh, using these viral capses AV9, which is actually what was uh, used for, for spinal muscular atrophy, these are small viruses um, that do not appear to have any pathological effect um, and AV9 in particular was shown early on to be able to reach the spinal cord, which is an important tissue for spinal muscular atrophy. And so AV9 was selected uh, probably primarily for this reason. Certainly in younger infants, it, uh, given intravenously, it would 
uh, would be able to reach the spinal cord. So the medication now is called Onesemnagene Abiparvavec. I practice that a lot. Um, <laughs> did I say it right? Oh, I think so. <laughs> um, so it's a human SMN gene, SMN1 gene, cDNA, that's been placed in front of what's a promoter, called a promoter. So that's a sequence of DNA which is important in trying to get that gene expressed. And then it's packaged into an AAV9 capsid so that can reach its target tissue. There's preclinical pre -clinical data in mice and even in pigs, which I thought was really cool. Uh, when you watch the videos of these pigs uh, you know, being treated with uh, gene therapy. And then, of course, we're talking about humans. So uh, this is just data from the initial phase one study. Um, um, this is all conducted at Columbus, uh, in Columbus at um, Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, under Jerry Mandel's um, um, uh, oversight. And he uh, recruited 15 patients with type 1 SMA. Um, so they all had two copies. They did not have the genetic modifier um, so that these, these patients appeared at, by all accounts to really be type 1 patients. They had to be treated with prednisolone at one milligram per kilogram and continued on to prevent any inflammatory reactions that might occur with this, with a dosing of 10 to the 14th viral capsids uh, per kilogram. It's a lot of capsids. Um, there are two dose, dose cohorts, and the second dose cohort is 1.1 times 10 to the 14th vector genomes or viral capsids per kilogram. And so what you can see here is these are just some pictures of some of the patients from the higher dose cohort, and, and they're sitting, and they're, so type 1 patients are not supposed to be able to sit. And, and a few of them are actually standing and walking, and, and this eventually led to the um, FDA approval of Onosem gene at Parvec, um, May 24th of earlier this year. On a personal note, that was uh, happened to be my birthday. I was flying back from Europe, and I landed in Dallas, and I got about 25 text messages. I thought everyone was wishing me a happy birthday. <laughs> a few of them were. <laughs> yeah. So the FDA indication, um, so the dose is uh, weight-based. I just show what 1.1 times 10 to the 14th is. It's a whole lot of zeros. Um, and it's indicated for children with SMA less than two years of age. They have to be on prednisolone treatment at, for at one milligram per kilogram at least for a month and then taper as tolerated. And then these are the different tests that need to be followed. It's not a non-pathogenic capsid or virus, but as one of my colleagues, uh, Francesco Montoni, pointed out once, he said, you know, water is not pathogenic, but if you inject a whole lot of water into somebody, that's probably going to have some effect. So. So this is just a little chart showing you um, what's being looked at. There are, these are the ongoing multicenter studies, uh, SPRINT, STRIVE, and STRONG. Um, so SPRINT and STRIVE are looking at intravenous on a SEM gene at Paparvivec. Um, and so that's within the FDA indication. There is data that's being collected. Uh, so I think we're going to see more and more data. Um, but the, in the meantime, the drug has already been approved. Strong is for type 2 patients um, that are already symptomatic. It's being given intrathecally, and that is not uh, within the FDA-approved indication. This is still in investigational. So what is next is looking at intrathecal um, in type 2 patients and perhaps across the whole spectrum. There are a couple of different studies that are being proposed as well. Uh, right now, um, the intrathecal program is on a on a hold because they're looking at some um, safety data actually in monkeys, um, wondering if there's an inflammatory reaction. I think we're hoping that that'll all get resolved um, so that we would be able to continue with looking at intrathecal because certainly genetic diseases of the central nervous system in general are going to really rely on intrathecal uh, delivery of uh, gene therapy in the future. But of course, I've talked about now three different strategies, four different um, 
agents that are SMN restoring therapies, nusinersen, onisemgen, abaparvivec, and rizdaplam, ranoplam as well, but rizdaplam does actually have uh, a drug application with the FDA at this point. So um, these are disease modifying therapies that treat the underlying cause of the disease. And so we have a rationale for newborn screening and SMA was added to the federal recommended uniform screening panel, the RUSP, that was as of uh, July 3rd, 2018. We're in California, so I'll just highlight California has a law that states that we have to institute within two years. And given the bureaucracy and everything that has to go through, we probably will take all, almost all two years to implement it. But of course, we're all very excited that we'll be able to start diagnosing these patients earlier soon. So we're maybe, I think, John, you said June, um, late June, July 1st, you know, this is coming up very soon. But of course, compound heterozygous patients will not be um, screened positive in these patients because we're looking for deletions, which we're seeing in 95% of patients. I'm just gonna shift gears to a couple of other um, um, different therapeutic approaches. Um, we're excited that there are disease-modifying treatments um, with SMN rest restoration, but of course, you know, if we start restoring SMN in all of our patients, we all start wondering what's next, what else can we do for our patients? These patients are uh, likely to be symptomatic, and is there anything we can do to, to take a different strategy that would be complementary um, and additive to SMN restoring therapies? So one of the um, strategies I'm just gonna briefly highlight here is rel deceptive. The way rel deceptive works is it uh, increases uh, troponin C and it's, it, it, uh, it causes troponin C to hold on to calcium longer and that actually increases uh, the muscle response to calcium. And so the idea here is that it would actually possibly inc increase strength in, in patients uh, with various different muscle diseases, but in this case, uh, Spinal muscular atrophy is being studied. And so a phase two uh, study has been completed. Um, it did show some promising efficacy signals, clinical efficacy signals, but the serum levels of the drug didn't reach what they were hoping to reach. And I think we're also hoping to see some stronger uh, clinical efficacy measure uh, signals. And so I think a follow-up study is being considered at this point. And Finally, myostatin. I think this is a nice uh, picture to illustrate what myostatin is about. We have uh, two mice here, and the, the mutated mouse is the bigger mouse. And if you do a little dissection of the mouse, you can see that the bigger mouse looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, and Sage and Lee called him Mighty Mouse. Uh, he was the guy who discovered uh, myostatin. And it's subsequently been found that there uh, so what the way myostatin works is it inhibits muscle growth, and if you take out myostatin, if you mutate it, or if you're somehow able to remove it, then you're going to promote muscle growth. Subsequently, we've seen naturally occurring mutants in, in the animal population. Um, this is a Belgian blue cow showing a lot of muscles. There's also racing dogs. Um, the racing, these are both... Uh, Whippets, actually, one's, uh, the one on the left, the smaller one's the racing dog, is a whippet, and the one on the right is a bully whippet. Uh, the bully whippets are actually not very fast, so they're not used, but they're, um, they're homozygous, whereas the heterozygous are actually fast uh, dogs, so it's, and, uh, and actually there's been a human uh, that's been reported to have uh, homozygous uh, mutations within myostatin. But the idea here is that if you are somehow able to remove myostatin, um, then that could promote muscle growth and that perhaps could have a, a clinically beneficial effect on patients with neuromuscular disease. This has been studied in a number of different neuromuscular diseases. Um, certainly muscle bulk is seen and uh, I think we're hoping that perhaps one of these programs is going to show an increase in performance and muscle skill, uh, muscle um, in, in um, motor skills. Uh, Scholar Rock has a program. Currently, I think Dr. Day uh, um, mentioned the Topaz study. It was a phase two study that's ongoing. And I hear rumors that there may be others on the way. Um, those are just rumors, perhaps. 
But to go back to spinal muscular atrophy, um, you know, we're looking at patients um, who have spinal muscular atrophy, and if we treat them, then um, we treat them early enough, we can alter their, their course, we can improve their outcomes in the long term. Um, and this is just taken from a review looking at, you know, perhaps uh, a theoretical view of sp uh, motor neurons and how they could be lost through time as patients get older. And if you intervene over here on the left, uh, that would be a more optimal time to intervene with an SMN uh, restoring therapy. And so if you look, this is of course um, a theoretical idea. The motor function is just sort of an arbitrary concept that's being shown here on this graph. But you have what's normal and then type 1, type 2, and type 3 patients. And perhaps if you intervene, let's say, on a type 2 patient or somebody who's destined to be a type 2 patient, but if you intervene earlier, you can see that you have a, a better curve than if you intervene a little bit later or even further later. And perhaps if we have additional therapies like rel deceptive or scholar rocks medication, perhaps it can have some additive effect on top of that. So this is my last slide. Uh, in summary, I've talked, I've briefly reviewed the genetics and pathogenesis of SMA. I looked at antisense oligonucleotide modulation of splicing with nusinersen. This is an approved drug. I briefly touched on two small molecules, including Rizdaplan, which has now been submitted to the FDA, and the FDA has accepted the application. Um, so we'll be hearing next year about their decision. Uh, I talked about gene therapy on a SEM gene at Parvovec. XIOI, which apparently is part of the name, um, and that was approved earlier this year. And I briefly touched upon two strategies that are under investigation, rel deceptive as well as myostatin inhibition uh, for SMA. And I thank you for your attention. Great. So I failed to do part of my job, and that was to introduce the moderator for the session, who's uh, Basil Darris, uh, runs the neuromuscular program at Boston Children's, and so he'll help shepherd us through the Q&A uh, part of this with uh, Dr. Shea, after which we'll have a half-hour break. And Thank you, John. So uh, we do have one question already. Um, uh, what are the latest advances in stem cell research in other cures for SMA? So I'm not aware of any active investigations in uh, stem cells in SMA. I do think that what we're seeing here, though, is some really impressive and um, promising treatments and approved treatments that restore the underlying cause of SMA. So it's not clear to me that we need to really investigate stem cells in in, um, in the page, at least in, in treating, treating the underlying cause. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any comments on that. Anybody? I, in the I mean, there were some efforts in Italy a number of years ago, uh, which actually failed. The, there were some legal issues also because some families were suing, trying to get access to the so-called stem cell therapy. But eventually, you know, it doesn't seem that we had any success. And the stem cells are used as a way to test new drugs. I mean, they're very, they can be very, very useful to study the biology of, um, of, of, of SMA and all that, but it doesn't seem we're close to any uh, therapeutic trials, I think, for, for stem cells for SMA. Yeah, I could just uh, amplify what Dr. Darris said. The Italian experience was actually uh, unfortunate, uh, uh, so it was misguided, I think, in retrospect. Uh, it, so stem cells were injected, but they uh, don't know really where to go <laughs> um, once you inject them uh, into the bloodstream. I think uh, we can learn uh, somewhat from the ALS experience where stem cells were injected uh, directly into the spinal cord with the idea that they may repopulate motor neurons, but in fact, it doesn't seem to do that. What it does is it provides uh, cells that uh, provide trophic factors that may secondarily uh, support the motor neurons. Uh, but I don't think it's yet to the point where we can replace motor neurons that have been lost. So there's the urgency to rescue the motor neurons that we have as early as possible. Any other questions? 
Uh, feel free to come to the microphones if you don't want to use the, uh, the system here. Uh, so is that clear, can, huh? Maybe we can ask you a question. <laughs> yeah. it, can you elaborate a little more on the uh, predictive value of the estimate to copy number in predicting the, the, the phenotype? I mean, it's nice to see those numbers in distribution, but how do you use those, th those numbers in the clinic? So I think, you know, we've all seen, seen that there's a little bit of noise. Um, so as we say that the patients who have two, we often say that patients who have two copies are really likely to be type 1, but there, there are exceptions to that, and so it's, it's difficult to say for sure 100%. I think the noise tends to appear a little bit more when, you, when you're looking at type patients with three copies or four copies of SMN2, um, and we've seen a lot of patients. We've actually seen a, lot, a number of us have seen siblings who have the same number of copies who have different phenotypes. So I certainly can think of at least one patient I just recently saw who, one set of siblings I recently saw who the type, the, uh, one sibling had a pretty severe type 2 phenotype and the other one actually we didn't even think had SMA for a while until we tested him and they certainly have the same number of copies of SMA too. So. So I think the predictive value is only on a population level. I think we're, if you're looking at individual patients, it's, it's difficult to really hang your hat on that. Yeah, we do also have a family where uh, they have three copies of SMN2, two, two siblings, and the one has classic type 2 SMA, the other has the type 3, so it's his ambulatory. But I think within a particular subtype, let's say you have a baby who looks like SMA type 1, uh, and he has three copies of of SMN2. I've noticed that those, they tend to be somewhat stronger. And if you have babies who have only one copy of SMN2, would be, those are usually the severe phenotypes that we call SMA type zero. So I think within a particular subtype may have some, some predictive value. But overall, the overlap is so significant, it's very hard to, to predict the phenotype in the clinic, particularly when a baby is born, is only like 10 days old, and you get the SMN copy number. It's very hard to tell the family how things are going to, 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 to evolve, even if you have a sibling who has SMA. And I, I think to add to that, that we're in the era now where the, the SMA type doesn't even matter. If we're, t if we're treating them at birth, if they're never going to have these symptoms, then mm -hmm. what is a type 1? What is a type 2? Mm -hmm. And I love being in that era. Yeah, yeah uh, I agree. <laughs> Perry, I had a question. If you could speculate or comment about your experience at UCLA using maybe multiple of these ther therapies at the same time, like people would get gene therapy and then get nucinersen or the scholar Ock, or however these are going to come together, what should we expect in the future? Are people going to get one treatment? Are they going to get 10? Yeah, so I don't, uh, so I think you can distinguish between the SMN restoring therapies versus the non SMN restoring therapies. And certainly we're looking forward to being able to treat um, with additional medications, you know, one SMN restoring therapy as well as other uh, non SMN restoring therapies. Um, I, I can't speak to my experience because I actually don't know that I've, I don't think I have a single patient who's actually been on two therapies yet. Okay. Um, maybe some of the other faculty can speak to that. I don't think that there are, and I, I don't, I certainly don't have any patients who've been on two SMN restoring therapies. Um, I think I had one who did cross over to another rest, SMN restoring therapy from. Uh, we do have three infants who, uh, three uh, children uh, who uh, were on Spinraza for a long period of time, uh, between 15 months and 18 months or so, uh, who received gene therapy recently. Uh, the last two were in September, October, so we don't really have enough, enough uh, experience yet, but the one who was dosed in, in July, she was getting gene therapy, uh, Spinraza for about 18 months, and then she got gene therapy in July uh, of this year, and uh, sometime in September, October, her more function really started going up. I don't think that's the result of Spinraza. I think it's so pronounced that it must be the, the result of gene therapy, but we can never be sure. Barry, first, thanks. That was a beautiful review of what we currently know. 
Uh, one thing that has interested me and to some degree frustrated me is that uh, the patients who are treated early, pre-symptomatic, tend to have the best outcome. Probably a basic rule that we're learning about developmental disorders, uh, treat them early, phenylketonuria, treat them early. Uh, if you wait, you can't uh, do as well. Uh, and then compare it to the symptomatic patient who's been symptomatic for periods of time, and their response to these same therapies are blunted or minimal, or maybe not at all, in, in fact. And so the question in part that I'm asking of you and others is, why is that? Now, I, I guess the simple answer is they've lost all their motor neurons and therefore there's nothing to work on and so forth. I don't think the pathology that we have will necessarily support that concept. So I'm interested in speculating on what other interventions might be worthwhile that we're not yet exploring. And uh, so Dr. Finkel mentioned the issue of trophy factors, for example, whether we should be supplementing these treatments for SMN2 or SMN1 with trophic factors that are designed to put the neuromuscular junction back together again, since that really is the, the weakness in the, in the circuit that we have a withdrawal of the neuromuscular junction. The question is, will replacement with these treatments reestablish that connection or whether we need something else that biologically is designed to make a functioning neuromuscular junction as such. So I think it's open for speculation and I, I would be very interested in what thoughts you might have in that regard. And the, the final point which bears on that and was touched on is I, I personally am not aware of any patient, I was interested in Dr. Darris's comment, of a patient who failed to get a good response to a treatment, whatever it is, and then was treated with something else and got a good response, uh, my experience had been the opposite. That is, if you don't respond to nursinosinoma, you don't respond to gene therapy, you're likely not to respond to the other things, which I think bears on the first part of my question as such. The, the ones that I described, <coughs> excuse me, the ones that I described, they had some response to spinoraza. They had some response to spinoraza over a number of months. I, there is another question over there. Hi, coming back to the question about Sorry, copy, copy number and newborn screening, um, how do we decide as to who we should treat in terms of, since we know that copy number doesn't have as good uh, and sort of implication for the future, um, should we be treating with four or more copies in term, and what age should those children start treatment when they're positive in newborn screening? Yeah, so that's that's a, a very good question, and I don't think you know there, there you won't have unanimous unanimous answers on on that if you ask a team of experts. I mean, certainly, I think we all agree that two copies should be treated. Most of us, almost all of us, agree that three copies should be treated. And I think you know if we're you know we're looking at four copies right now, and certainly I think many of us are looking at if if you're having. Uh, single time ther a single therapy um, treatment such as gene therapy, you can consider four copies uh, uh, treating pre-symptomatically just because it's a single therapy, at least we believe it is at this point. That's, um, that's yet to be proven. But um, So that's sort of been, I think, the general consensus opinion among many of us is that that's, uh, um, you know, the, the idea with four copies is that, you know, if, if a person is not, if a patient is not likely to develop symptoms for a few years, would it, it wouldn't be appropriate to be subjecting these patients to, to uh, um, intrathecal injections every, every four months. But, but if you're, on the other hand, if you're talking about a, um, a gene therapy um, approach, that perhaps that you can consider a treating patient with four copies. I don't know if anybody else over the faculty had much to add. I, I think there are a number of opinions, and I think that we probably do feel a little bit differently about that. But it is true that there is a need for SMN protein early on developmentally, then it makes sense to replace that SMN protein at a time when it's developmentally appropriate, regardless of how many copy numbers you have, would be my 
my take on things. If that really is true, that that is a critical need, then replacing SMN at a time developmentally when it's needed would be my posture. But we do have different opinions. That's true. Hi, Jennifer Schimek. I'm one of the genetics fellows here at Stanford. And I had a question that kind of builds on the, the last topic. Uh, you know, right now, we do offer prenatal screening or carrier screening for parents uh, for SMA. Um, and so my question is, what, you know, what per percentage at this point um, is identified prenatally uh, in terms of uh, SMA uh, compared to what we're projecting with the newborn screen? And whether or not, if there will be a push to do more testing prenatally, um, where we could identify uh, SMA even earlier and sort of hit the ground running at the time of birth versus waiting for the newborn screen results. Yeah, so I don't think that there are statistics available on how, what percentage of patients are actually being identified. Uh, does any, anybody aware of current statistics? This is a relatively new recommendation, I think, and, and so some, most, you know, uh, OBGYNs are starting to to also be aware of this and, and push for screening. Uh, but in terms of the number of patients that are being picked up prenatally, it also varies, I think, from region to region. Um. I have to make another comment about that. Just that I think that in our experience with prenatal testing, it has been so helpful from a practical standpoint because at a time prenatally when you can bring parents in, talk to them about spinal muscular atrophy and the treatment options and trials that have been done, it's so much more helpful than identifying a baby at birth and having the family come in, you know, in their perinatal period when, you know, they're exhausted, it's a shock. Um, it's so helpful to have that prenatal screen. So um, I think that it's becoming in our region much more common and popular. So within a four-month period of time, I think we had six families that came in. Some of them did not end up, they were carrier parents. Some of them did not have babies that were affected. But having those discussions with both parents prior to delivery was wonderful. Yeah, I agree with that. That definitely, you know, because if you're catching them um, on newborn screen, it's, the families are still in this, you know, mode of deer caught in headlights just trying to understand what, what they're dealing with here and you're, we're trying to move forward with treating them with some SMN restoring therapy and s sometimes that's, it's, it's almost feels like a rushed discussion because the family's still trying to, trying to wrap their head around the disease. It's a lot more helpful. And my time's up, you said. Okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe one more question. There's okay. one here. Okay. Uh, how do you decide if a patient receives nucinersin versus Zolgensma versus Ristiplam or a combination? So um, I generally lay out the options to all of my patients and tell them what their patients are a candidate for and let them decide. So I talk about, give them as much information as I possibly can about what the different options are and, and I'll let the, the family decide. Sometimes they will, you know, not know, in which case I, I have another discussion with them. They, I ask them to go and, and, and do a little more thinking about that. But I think it's, it's a decision that the family should make themselves. Thank you, Dr. Shea. Okay. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.